This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Today on the program, Radio Rewind. We've dusted off two classic interviews, one with legendary science communicator Carl Sagan, the other a conversation with Temple Grandin, the animal scientist and autism activist. First up, Carl Sagan recorded in May of 1996, just six months before he passed away. It was the last time we ever talked with him on Science Friday, and he spoke of his beliefs about science and democracy, God, UFOs, and why maybe science nerds should get Letterman jackets. Astronomer Carl Sagan has spent, oh, about two decades, a good part of his career, trying to make science more understandable and relevant to we non-scientists. From his early days as a visible spokesman for the Viking Mars lander, to his Pulitzer Prize for Dragons of Eden, to his landmark TV series Cosmos, Dr. Sagan is trying to show that science is a tool for exploring the unknown, for rationally investigating and answering the mysteries of the world we live in. Carl Sagan, Master Communicator, joins me today to tell us why the scientific method is so important, so elegant, and so successful, and why people who believe in aliens, UFOs, and ESP abandon critical thinking when they buy into pseudoscientific happenings. Now let me formally introduce my guest. I mean, what can you say about Carl Sagan that hasn't been said already? He is professionally the Duncan Professor of Astronomy and Space Sciences at Cornell University in Ithaca. His most recent book is The Demon-Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, published by Random House, and he joins us from station KUOW in Seattle. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Ira. Thank you for that generous introduction. Oh, well, (laughs) it's the generous. It's the facts, man, just the facts. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a book. When an author decides to write a book, they usually feel very strongly about something. And that I, I think that of all the books that you've written, this latest, The Demon Haunted World, really shows that you're angry about something here, a, a, about pseudoscience and the lack of rational thought. Would that be a correct assumption? Well, I'm certainly uh, concerned. Uh, I don't know if angry is right, although maybe it is. Maybe, maybe I am a, uh, a little angry that we have such great tools, such powerful mental apparatus at our command, which we tend to ignore. I mean, science, more than a body of knowledge, is a way of thinking. And uh, its enormous success mm-hmm. is due to, to accepting uh, contentions only on the basis of evidence and uh, compelling evidence at that. It doesn't matter if it feels good. What matters is if it's true. And naturally, there are people who want what feels good. I mean, that that makes a lot of Mm -hmm. sense. And if uh, discovering that we're not at the center of the universe, we're not the apple of God's eye, and so on, those contentions rub a lot of people the wrong way. And they'd rather not hear from science on such issues. Uh, They'd rather have their own fantasies which make them feel good but are are we going through an unusual period I, I i was turning the tuning through the dials last night on television and there are there are shows you know there are shows called sightings and other shows like it that are just popping up all over the place dealing with psychic phenomena alien abduction all the kinds of things that you talk about in your book are we going through an unusual period in history where there's a tremendous popularity in this that, that there has never been before No, I don't think so. I think uh, this way of looking at things, embracing pseudoscience and superstition and uh, uh, fundamentalist zealotry has been with us humans for all of our history. Uh, It's not surprising that we should uh, find that it's still around. But what is a little surprising is that science which is so successful, which is responsible for the, for our lives in most cases, um, is so poorly taught, is so poorly understood, and that the kind of skepticism that we would use in purchasing a used car is uh, in many cases not in evidence on ESP and crop circles and uh, literal uh, interpretation of what's written in the Bible and so on. Mm-hmm. Yet, yet you point out in the book that you, yourself you had a, a terrible science education, and look what happened to you. You went on to become interested in science. Could that well, not happen to other people? Uh, I'm sure it could, but but uh, I mean, you know, growing up in 
in the 30s and 40s, uh, I didn't have a good science education, although I had, I had lots of science uh, courses in uh, middle school and high school. But it wasn't until I got to college that I had real science by people who actually understood it, understood how to teach it, and that was such a breath of fresh air. Uh, today we spend a lot of money and, and a lot of time on science education in the schools, but very often it is inadequately taught. You know, why is the basketball coach teaching chemistry? Why is the science all from the book and so little from the laboratory? Why are teachers nervous when bright kids ask penetrating questions? Why do the varsity basketball, baseball, and football players get spiffy jackets that are attractive to the opposite sex? But uh, expert mathematicians and scientists and historians and, and uh, others not get spiffy jackets. Oh. Who made those decisions? Why, why are we doing things that way? And that's a kind of um, hint of, of the nature of the problem. It, uh, it runs up and down our society. Uh, almost every newspaper in the country has a daily astrology column. Most don't even have a weekly science column. When's the last time you saw science discussed on those dreary Sunday morning uh, insider political programs? When's the last time a president of the United States made uh, an intelligent well, remark on well, science? And so on. Well, I think that's a good point because I think that my own personal feeling about this is that people do want to talk about science. And they are very interested in the unknown. They are interested in where we're coming, we came from, where we're going. And so the only place they get to see anything like that is in these new breeds of programs that are on the air. The, the, uh, the, absolutely. You know, and so now at least here's an opportunity to let their mind expand and watch them and think about something, even if it's pseudoscience. You see, my, my experience is that, uh, that all children have an intact sense of wonder. Uh, that is, when I teach kindergarten or first grade, uh, I have a room full of scientists, at least as far as wonder is concerned. They're not up on the skepticism quotient yet, but, but that's fine. That's something that can be taught to them. But by the time they get to high school, when I talk to seniors, 12th graders, it's all gone. There are no follow-up questions. They're not listening to what their colleagues are saying. They're worried about how their questions will be received by their peers. Uh, their minds have been turned off. The sense of wonder is almost gone. Something dreadful happens to students between first and twelfth grades, and it's not just puberty. The, the interest in science, which is there in first grade, is somehow beaten out of them by twelfth grade. And I think part of it is that there are adults who are nervous about being asked penetrating questions by, by young people, and so they give off-putting answers. You know, why is the moon round? Well, what did you expect it to be, square? Uh, instead of encouraging the child, it's a deep question, why is the moon round? It can get to the nature of gravitation, of uh, central forces, the strength of materials. There's so much in there if you wanted to pursue it. And likewise, all those other wonderful questions that kids ask, why do we have toes? What's the birthday of the world? How deep could you dig a hole? and so on. Every one of those is an aperture to exciting children, their, their natural aptitude and interest in science, exciting that, and encouraging them, not necessarily to be professional scientists, but to be citizens who have a responsible role in dealing with science. We have a society based on science and technology, and at the same time have arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. That's a prescription for disaster as clear as anything. And, and they, then look, uh, they then look towards scientists or people of scientists to explain to them how things work or what's wrong with the society. And yet at the same time, a lot of people, because uh, scientists work for, quote-unquote, the government or, or paid for by big universities, they're also distrustful of what they hear that scientists have to say, thinking that this is the, just another government cover-up. A lot of... A lot of, 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 of the politics of the age we're living in has also filtered into the world of science, and this has been going on for years. Uh, well, I think it, it should be said, Ira, that uh, scientists, because science and technology are so powerful, scientists have provided 
uh, instruments of destruction. I mean, it really is true that scientists are, yeah. in some sense, responsible for nuclear weapons, which could destroy the global civilization, maybe the species. Scientists have played a key role in the uh, means by which the ozone layer is destroyed and uh, uh, by which uh, global warming is happening. And so it is natural, especially if scientists are not in the media explaining what they're about, for people to mistrust scientists. And you see it in the Saturday morning cartoon mad scientist uh, caricature, which is very prevalent. Let's go to uh, Pete in Seattle. Hi, Pete. Yes, um, thanks for taking my call. Mr. Sagan, I'm a big fan of yours, and I think that the lack of critical thinking skills is, is practically almost the root of all evil. Um, successful critical thinking goes way beyond, you know, scientific topics. Uh, it goes into all every part of our life, social behavior, economics, morality, ethics, and all that kind of thing. I'm wondering what we can do to try and do, do a little more organized teaching of critical thinking skills, maybe in the schools. Yes, well... Uh, part of the problem is you uh, you start teaching young people critical thinking, and then they'll start uh, criticizing their political institutions <laughs> and good. their religious institutions. And, That's all right. And, yeah, but then the people in power say, "Oh my God, what are we doing?" Well, um, I'm thinking about trying to get the people in power as as, as part of the students in this project. You know, like, I think yeah, but both. I. I think people in power have a vested interest to oppose critical thinking. Yeah, they sure you do. See, you see, if we, uh, if we don't improve our understanding of, uh, of critical thinking and ha develop it as kind of second nature, then we're, we're just suckers ready to be taken by the next charlatan who ambles along. And there are lots of charlatans. There are lots of ways of gaining power and money by deceiving people who are not skilled in, in critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So what you suggest is is absolutely essential, but getting it done is very difficult since there are so many institutional impediments. We have to take a break. When we come back, more Carl Sagan from the Science Friday Archives. I'm Ira Flato, and you're listening to Science Friday from NPR. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato, continuing our interview with the late Carl Sagan, recorded back in May of 1996. It's amazing how much of what he said decades ago is still so relevant today. A lot of times scientists uh, speak down to people, and they, they are condescending. Uh, even, I mean, as a journalist, I've had it happen to me many times, but that's part of, that's part of my business. But I also think that when people ask a question, or especially about something that they don't understand, it's something that is in the realm of the paranormal, or they are truly questioning it, that scientists will say, that's not an area we are going to spend any money to investigate. You, you know, why do you ask such a silly question, and we're not going to look into it and just go away? Much the way that probably their teachers talk to them. When, in effect, that, that, that people are looking for scientists to answer these questions about any of these topics that you, you mention in your book. I, mean, I well, think this is sort of a failing of scientists to answer those questions. I agree with you again, Ira. Uh, the, the, uh, the general attitude of many scientists is that, um, that such questions are interesting and important, but that the, the work that's been done shows that it's very unlikely there's anything to it. Mm -hmm. But that's very different from saying that asking about ESP is a question beneath contempt. No scientist should do that. You don't dismiss questions before you look into them, but only after you look into them. It's sort of the difference between prejudice and what I might call post-judice. <laughs> uh, post-judice is perfectly okay, but prejudice is not. There has always been a fraction of the scientific community that uh, not only uh, dismisses such questions, but dismisses the whole idea of explaining what they're about to the public. In the 6th century BC, the Pythagoreans discovered that the square root of 2 was an irrational number. That is, could not be represented as the ratio of any two numbers, no matter how big. This information about the irrationality of the square root of two was promptly classified top secret. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a Pythagorean 
who made the mistake of explaining it to the public. And when his ship went down and he drowned, Pythagoreans uh, all over the Aegean nodded their heads saying, you see, the gods have stepped in to prevent the popularization of science. Now, I think scientists have an obligation, if nothing else, for selfish reasons to explain what they're doing, to explain the joy and power of science. We live in a democracy. The people are supposed to have something to say about what the government does. Every day there are scientific issues being legislated on. And how can we instruct our elected representatives if we don't understand what the issues are? I mean, AIDS and cancer and superconducting super colliders and decaying infrastructure and should we send people to Mars and uh, all of those questions, uh, genetic engineering and, and uh, many medical issues, all those questions involve science. We must understand those issues just for our own well-being. Then there are economic questions. There are industries that are fleeing American shores because American workers at the entry level are insufficiently educated in eighth grade arithmetic or whatever it is to uh, produce quality products. Then there's the fact that s science in our time has been able to approach the deepest questions of origins, something that every human culture has been interested in and spent some resources on. Where do we come from? Where does life come from? Where does our planet come from? Where does the whole universe come from? We actually have some preliminary answers to those questions, and you have to be made out of wood not to be interested a little bit in that. People are so grateful to learn uh, some of, of the tentative answers to these questions. And then finally, that skeptical questioning uh, don't accept what authority tells you uh, attitude of science is also nearly identical to the attitude of mind necessary for a functioning democracy. And uh, uh, science and democracy have very consonant values and approaches and uh, I don't think you can have the one without the other. Let's go to Mike in Juneau, Wisconsin. Hi, Mike. Hi, Ira. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to finally get to talk to you, Mr. Sagan. What I wanted to ask you years ago when I met you, and I'd like to ask you now, a very personal question. What is your real uh, belief in the, uh, in the spiritual beginnings of all of this? In other words, I've read many places that many scientists such as yourself are either agnostic or atheistic in their beliefs about uh, the initial beginnings of the universe. Uh, and secondly, my brother-in-law is, uh, is a highly classified uh, person that works for the Air Force. Uh, the question revolves around what your belief is in UFOs. He's told me some things that I can't repeat about the Roswell incident. Perhaps you could uh, give us your, your thoughts on that. Let's start with the last one first. Sure. Okay, Dr. Uh, okay, but I don't want to duck the first one. Okay, we'll get... get <laughs> well, um, in uh, 1947, in uh, near Roswell, New Mexico, uh, stuff came down on a ranch. And the stuff was then picked up by uh, Air Force personnel. People apparently were told to keep quiet about it. And over the years, the story has... Uh, emerged that uh, these were parts of a crashed alien spacecraft and that little alien bodies were shipped to uh, an Air Force base in Ohio uh, and that they're still languishing in freezers uh, with their perfect teeth. The actual fact seems to be that as the Air Force announced very belatedly just a couple of years ago, uh, that this was a balloon at tropopause altitudes that is just where the stratosphere begins with acoustic inf uh, instruments designed to detect Soviet nuclear weapons explosions from halfway around the, the world. There is an acoustic channel at the tropopause uh, by which you might be able to hear uh, such explosions. And this was a matter of the highest concern for the security of the United States and was properly 
classified. Newspaper photographs uh, at the time show flimsy polyethylene-like uh, material and balsa wood, hardly consistent with a, uh, an, the spacecraft of an alien advanced civilization, but perfectly consistent with uh, balloons. I think that, uh, you know, there are two museums of, of UFOs in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, you can make money, you can get your name in the paper, you can have a break from the humdrum day by inventing stories about Roswell, New Mexico. I don't know what your brother has told you, but I would treat it with a real grain of salt. Does that mean you, you don't believe in UFOs? Well, what do we mean by believe, which in fact takes us to the first question. <laughs> so, what, what do we mean by believe? If the evidence is compelling, then we believe. If the evidence is not compelling, we don't believe. We withhold judgment. And UFOs merely is an abbreviation for unidentified flying objects. If we see something in the sky, we don't know what it is. To my mind, that's it. We don't know what it is. It does not automatically follow that it's spacecraft from somewhere else. The vast majority of UFO reports have quite prosaic explanations. People, uh, it's partly people seeing natural phenomena in the sky with which they're unfamiliar, including cases of astronomers doing that. Uh, sometimes conscious hoaxes, uh, sometimes uh, people with, uh, who, who hallucinate, and 25% of all people hallucinate. Uh, so uh, uh, there are many other explanations, and only if you've been able to eliminate all of those explanations would you give serious consideration to the possibility that we're being visited. Nobody's more interested than me in uh, the possibility of, of the existence of extraterrestrial life. I've been involved in sending spacecraft to other planets to look for it. I've been involved in, uh, in using large radio telescopes to listen for signals from civilizations on planets of other stars. It would save me so much effort if the aliens were here, uh, even if they are short, doer, and sexually obsessed as the... Uh, as the uh, alien abductees uh, so-called claim. And Bart, one of his question about your personal mm. beliefs. Okay, well, I, I treat the existence of uh, God and the perhaps creation of the universe in exactly the same way. What is the evidence? Now, the word God is used to cover a wide variety of very different ideas, ranging maybe from the idea of an outsized, light-skinned male with a long white beard who sits in a throne in the sky and uh, tallies the fall of every sparrow, for which there is no evidence, none at all, to the view of Einstein and Spinoza, uh, which is essentially that God is the sum total of the laws of nature. And since there are laws of nature, and since remarkably the same laws hold throughout this magnificent and vast universe. If that's what you mean by God, then of course there's a God. So everything depends on the definition of God. One last point you ask about uh, the origin of the universe, but that's assuming the issue in question, namely that there was an origin of the universe. And in some cosmological models, the universe is infinitely old therefore uncreated, therefore there's nothing for a creator to do. So I think these are very deep and difficult issues in which both theologians and scientists ought to bear in mind their own limitations. Uh, Carl, you know, reading the book, it would, you could come away, a person could come away saying, well, I guess that Carl Sagan believes that scientists are the only ones with the right answers. That there is only one answer, it's science, and only scientists then know what the right answers are. Would that, would that be a correct assumption? Well, it depends what you mean by science. If by science you mean that you bear in mind human fallibility mm -hmm. and you treat claims to knowledge skeptically, then I would agree. Science is the only way to go. But that's a very broad definition. Everybody, as I was saying before, who buys a used car would then be, be a scientist. Science is only a Latin word that means knowledge. And uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, imagine that it's, that it's something very erudite and mm -hmm. arcane. Uh, 
I, I just think the key point of science is criticism, debate, open inquiry, uh, the willingness to systematize knowledge, to withhold belief until the evidence is compelling, and to listen seriously to criticism. Hey, you've written lots of books uh, about science. Do you believe that, that television and, and the Cosmos series being the most spectacular and popular series of its kind, do you still believe that the popular medium is the way no matter how many issues of Scientific American are sold or, or whatever, that this is the way to, to influence people's views about science? I think that television is a tremendously useful and powerful and underused medium for exciting people about science, for eliciting their sense of wonder, and for teaching some uh, science facts, but mainly about getting people excited so they will go off and teach themselves or uh -huh. take courses or something of that sort. Cosmos, we never imagined would be as successful as it was. It's been seen by more than half a billion people in over 60 countries worldwide, and uh, it's still being seen, and I still get... Uh, letters and I'm stopped on the street by people who say how it changed their lives, how they were, uh, women especially say they were taught that science wasn't for them, that they were too uh -huh. stupid for science, that Cosmos got them excited about science and they went back and now they're a oceanographer or a microbiologist or whatever it is. There is a tendency to uh, discourage people from science, especially in, in junior high and high school, who are well fitted for science. We have a kind of fear of science and part of the reason is that science is able to uh, show what constitutes a wrong answer. And unlike uh, some other fields where no matter what you say might be right, here in science you can really make a mistake <laughs> and, uh, and have to defend your, your view before other people who can actually draw upon facts to disprove it. So it's, uh, it makes some people nervous, the people who want the world to conform to their wishes rather than to the universe's mm. own internal reality. This is Science Friday from NPR. I'm Ira Flato. You're working on a movie. Are you at a liberty to talk about that at all? I can talk about it a little, a little bit. bit. A new movie a, based on Contact, your book? Ba based on my novel Contact, about first contact with extraterrestrial intelligence via uh, the receipt of a complex radio message. It's uh, a Warner Brothers movie. It's starring Jodie Foster, and uh, it's uh, in production. Uh, primary photography will begin uh, sometime later this year, and uh, it's unclear when it should be uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the theaters, but uh, late 97 at the earliest. Can you teach science through this movie? Is, is, uh, is there I'm certainly work, I'm certainly working hard to uh, <laughs> to get across uh, some of the wonder and some of the method mm -hmm. of science and I think we're gonna gonna have some of that I, you know the big screen is uh, an amazing tool for teaching the the wonders of, uh, of astronomy especially uh, I I can't wait to see how some of the ideas that we're having are going to materialize on the on the big screen. You know, the Kubrick's film, 2001, The Space Odyssey, I thought was a milestone in teaching science. Right. It's amazing how 2001 stands up today. It doesn't look the least it's bit dated. Yeah. Whereas 2010, its successor with a non-Stanley Kubrick director, looked obsolescent when it came out. Uh, and today is, uh, yeah. is just terribly dated. So y you can do these things well, and you can do them poorly, and we're we're hoping with contact to do it well. So, so you'd be you'd be happy to have the two thousand one success that that movie had <laughs> that, that, that level. I'd, I'd I'd be happy to come anywhere within shouting distance of two thousand one. That was an extraordinary movie. And, and in, on a, on the serious side, though, the, the, but this is a good way to teach uh, to reach the public and to teach science. And, and if, movies and film. television can do amazing things in in teaching at least some science, but in mainly in making science accessible, in convincing people that they don't have to worry that they're too stupid to understand mm. it or that it's stuff that only nerds and geeks are interested in. I think everybody is interested in many mm. of the issues of science and just a question mm. of getting it to them in an accessible way. Carl, stay well. Thank you for Thank joining us. Thank you so me. much, Ira. Pleasure talking to Thanks you. Thanks again for coming on the program. Carl Sagan, of course, is a professor of astronomy and space sciences 
at Cornell University in Ithaca and author of an extremely good book, The Demon Haunted World, Science is a Candle in the Dark, published by Random House. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for joining me again today. A conversation with Carl Sagan recorded in 1996.